Good morning, folks. Good evening, folks, wherever you are. It depends on the time zone, but the same is that we're in Write the Docs podcast time. And it's Write the Docs podcast episode 29. We're nearly at 30. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's it seems to much on. <laughs> oh, That's right, Chris. <laughs> So we we have a, a different cast here today. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce uh, our regular um, podcasting crew, which is um, Chris Ward. Hello, Chris. Hey, how you doing, Jared? You got my oh, I, I do. I do actually have. You probably won't see this unless you're. Uh, you might actually if you watch YouTube and you're not watching this or listening to this through your ears through a podcasting app. But I've got a Write the Docs um, Australia shirt on. Uh, today it's the one that I always wear when I podcast for the show now because it's very cool um, that was from 2019's um, uh, conference and yeah I wear it with pride um, so yes it's very good now, what's been happening over in uh, Berlin oh you know uh, I finished a couple of contracts I got, I'm doing a few new things right now kind of in a little bit of an in-between time um, may have some news next episode but not right now <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so stay tuned for episode things, thirty. Things, trying stuff lots of stuff and trying lots of um, experiments right now. I'm sure we'll get to that soon. <laughs> There's plenty of time to do it, right? <laughs> yes, I, I I have been uh, messing around with stuff as well, but uh, it's uh, usually during work hours, which is actually good because you know uh, you get to try out new things and and push the boundaries of tools you use, which is pretty cool. But how are uh, you, Jared? That's oh, look, I'm never ask. <laughs> I'm all right. Look, you know, things are going well here. We've uh, switched to fully work from home at our place, we, uh, our, our, my workplace. Yeah, we, we've, uh, I do two days work from home regularly because of CNS type 1 diabetes. But um, now it's full five days a week um, work from home. And the adjustment's been a bit tough. It, I didn't think it would be because you know, I've been doing two days a week from home. But it's definitely different. But I guess we could probably go into that more in the show because it, it seems like it's probably on people's people's minds and I'm sure that um, uh, you and our guest today will actually have some tips about uh, how to manage that and um, as a as a sort of half good decent segue let's actually introduce our, our guest which today is Eric Holcher. How you going Eric? There. I'm doing all right about as, as good as could be expected I guess. <laughs> oh well that's fair enough. Now Eric for those who don't know what you do and how you're involved in Write the Docs do you want to give people a bit of a, an overview of what you do? Sure yeah so I guess kind of my my formal role is kind of co-founder um, and so I was one of the folks who kind of ran the first Write the Docs conference in Portland back in 2013 uh, and then I've been kind of around in the community uh, ever since so really trying to you know make it what it uh, hopefully should be in the world. And, and my kind of background there was I, I work on a product called Read the Docs, um, which does kind of, you can think about it as continuous integration for documentation, docs as code, you know, what all, all the things that we talk about that kind of spawned uh, the conference from my work on that stuff. So uh, that's kind of, yeah, that's my background. And so now I'm just kind of one of the, the core folks that work on Write the Docs and kind of keep things going. And my kind of core role still, Probably the biggest thing is I'm the chair of the Portland conference uh, at this point. So that's uh, that's me. Right. And we did actually, I was just checking, we did actually speak to you before. Actually, my God, it was a long time ago. A December long time ago. Like me and, was that me and Mikey? <laughs> yes, yeah, it was. I think there was, yeah. yeah, yeah. December 2017. Wow. Okay. <laughs> which, is, which is why we sort of thought, well, you know what? It's probably how we had you on again, Eric, because, you know, it's been a while between drinks. And, you know, <laughs> lots of stuff has happened between then and now. So it would be probably worthwhile getting you back on again and having a chat just in general about stuff. Um, and really, that's yeah, going to be the cool. format of the show today. Like, it's going to be uh, a bit of a uh, – there's no set agenda for today's show. We're just going to have a talk like we're, like we're sitting at a pub with, with a coffee or a beer, depending on what time zone we're at. And, um, <laughs> yeah, just have a bit of a laugh. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I know I don't know how much I'm going to – be able to say about the future at this point i feel like uh like in the last month the future has just turned into this haze of <laughs> oh yeah where you can't can't quite see anymore like it's a it's a very disorienting feeling but i'll i'll do my best <laughs> yeah no exactly right well maybe we should kick off with what we we do know and let's talk about a couple of things that the the community the the core organizers have been up to over the past few months i know there's a couple of things that have happened in the past few months that are a bit more 
definite. So maybe we should kick off with those. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like a good idea. What's the what's the first one? I think is the the salary survey, isn't it, Chris? Yeah. yeah. I Tell us know. a bit more about that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, this is something we've wanted to do uh, for a long time, and the the goal here really is to kind of reduce pay inequality um, across both you know geographies or genders or you know kind of along along all the different axes that we care about in the community and. You know, one of the biggest things holding people back from getting paid more is is just knowledge of how much their coworkers or their com- kind of comparable people are getting paid across the industry. Um, and so that was really the goal with the salary survey is to kind of ask people questions about their job and how much they're getting paid and compensation and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, really with the outcome being that hopefully that will give people some, you know, some value when they go to negotiate or change jobs or that kind of stuff. So. So yeah, I was really just trying to trying to understand what the kind of going rate is for various you know parts of the world. I think is is where we started with it, uh, which is mm. kind of the best thing that we could do. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that was the the goal there, and I think we've gotten some really good feedback that it's been very kind of interesting uh, for folks to read through it. So no, it's yeah. it's very interesting. Like the the whole thing about the salary survey is it's. The appeal of it for me is that the fact that, you know, you could probably, you know, go up to people that you work with in, like, say, your local region, like Brisbane, for me, for example, and sort of mm-hmm. quiz them approximately on on how much they, they might be earning if you're good friends with them. But, you know, it's an always an awkward conversation because often, you know, we have, you know, you're not supposed to talk about salary and stuff like that. Technically, it's definitely it's a taboo. Probably- yeah, it definitely is a taboo. I don't know why it is, but it, it seems to be. So um... well, I think it's so so a couple of interesting points there. Uh, first off, is actually in the United States, it's illegal for employers mm. to, uh, you know, it's it. Every employee has the ability to talk about their salary. It's actually illegal ah. for employers to to kind of reprimand or or you know, like punish you for some reason uh, for talking about it. So that's actually a protected thing, and at least in the U.S. and I imagine in a lot of other places as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the the main reason that the taboo exists is because, you know, employers benefit from it. <laughs> um, well, that's good. So I, yeah. Hmm. Look, I want to uh, take the point now just to welcome Tom Johnson to the show. <laughs> hey there, Tom. How are you going this morning or this, uh, this afternoon? I'm doing well. Thanks for, uh, yeah, let me join late here. I appreciate it. Sorry. No, that's all right. That's all right. So we were just, uh, we were talking about, uh, we're just introducing the salary survey and um, what uh, has been going on with that. So we'll, we'll keep on going with that. Um, so yeah, what insights, what do you think, if you could say the biggest insight from the salary survey, Eric, what do you reckon that would be? Um, I mean, I think really the biggest thing is just really kind of the the geographic breakdown of average salary. Um, so I think, you know, we definitely got a lot more responses from the U.S. and from kind of Northern America and Europe, just because that's kind of where our historical kind of community has has been the strongest. Um, but you know, I think there's just some really interesting ones with like, for example, I think the average salary in Canada was like sixty thousand, and the average mm-hmm. in the U.S. was like ninety thousand, for example. And I would expect those to be a little bit closer, you know, without knowing kind of how, you know, the industry salary works and all that kind of stuff. Um, And just similarly, kind of the the salaries across all the different geographies and that kind of stuff, how are they change? Um, And even within the US, they're, they're pretty, you know, dramatically different, uh, you know, based on maybe the West versus the East Coast or or these kind of things. Um, So yeah, I mean, I think that was really the the goal. And I think that was really the, the most interesting data for me. I mean, the thing that always jumps out at, at me, I, I see this a lot on, on Twitter when um, American engineers especially say, you know, people in Europe get paid a lot less. But of course, there's other factors in play with wages and things like that sometimes. And that's probably the same with Canada. Canada does have health care, doesn't they? I think. And stuff like Socialized that. Socialized health care, so, yep. Yeah. So, and that's the same in Europe. And actually, when I look at these numbers, they seem, they seem kind of just about right. Some jump out at me as being surprising for some places but for the most part they seem sort of what i would expect and yeah, i think the other the other yeah. thing is again the sample sizes right like i mean i think we got 350 responses from the u.s but you know from mm-hmm. like you know russia for example we only got nine so yeah the data there is going to be a little more a little more skewed for sure yeah i'm just curious how many did you get from australia and the sort of asia pacific region oceana, oceana. Yeah, i think we got 30 30 yeah. okay 
Yeah. Well, that's not bad. Um, yeah, and one I think you know, I think the goal with this is is like all things. The first time you do it, you're you're it always takes a little bit of of time to build you know momentum in the community uh, for any kind of initiative. And so you know, hopefully, as people get value out of this and they they have it you know have it impact them, then they're going to be more likely to to contribute and share it in the future. So you know, the goal would be to do it again next year and then hopefully get more respondents and uh, mm. make it even more valuable. So, well, that's fair think- enough. Actually, the the first question jumps out at me the most. Ninety four percent employed. I think I hang out in with self employed people too much. So <laughs> <laughs> that took me by surprise. <laughs> yeah, well, I know I know Tom. You've done a little bit with surveys as well, right? Like, I know. Have you kind of seen seen value in that over time? Yeah, I mean, I, I recently did a survey and, and realized a few things just about surveys in general, and one is that. Like they're hard to to do well, right? Uh, especially when you tackle something like salary. I mean, that's a very complex topic to survey, and I'm guessing that like the people who, you know, the team that was trying to process all this information probably, you know, had a lot of a lot of tough decisions and questions and complexities. I certainly think that um, uh, this is where the academic community kind of shines in their in their in analytical processes, but. Just like segmenting the audience and understanding if you're getting a good representation is key because um, I've seen some surveys where like the entire survey was a skewed demographic because it was just pulling from a specific group. And it's like, well, that's not representative. So are are there any sort of complexities that you had to wrangle with with this that you want to call out? Um, Yeah, I mean, there was definitely a lot of it around kind of normalizing data and, you know, like. I think there was a few places where we maybe weren't super explicit with the question, whether, you know, it's maybe some people put monthly salaries versus yearly salaries or, you know, pre-tax or post-tax, or you just, I think there's a lot of places along the lines with benefits as well. Right. I mean, to your point, right. Like salaries are like working from home is a, a huge benefit that isn't monetary or, you know, and then along every axis, you have to slice it in a subset of ways, right. You can't just, if it, if you want to keep the data somewhat anonymous, like you can't just say, you know, for every person that worked from home that worked in, you know, Pennsylvania that, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you end up kind of being very constrained with what you can actually say and wh- how you can break it down. Um, which I definitely, and it, it, yeah, and it took us longer than we, we wish to kind of actually process it, you know, because of some of that complexity where, mm. you know, we had to go through and, and try and find the outliers and, um, yeah. So we, we tried to make notes of where that happened, but you know, again, yeah, it's a very, very complex thing and we definitely have some some notes for how to do it again better uh, for next year <laughs> yeah I'm just looking at the the median salary by by state part right where California the median salary was 120 and Washington was 126 New York 105 All right my immediate questions would be uh, is this just base salary and then do you have to add on your restricted stock units or RSU signing bonus? a cost of living, like how do you factor that in? So if somebody who's working in California, say, how do they know if that salary is a good salary based on all these other inputs and additions or the omission of them? How do you how do you handle that? I mean, I think we basically just said, you know, the annual value, expected value of your of your salary, right? So yeah, I, I don't think it would necessarily count a signing bonus, for example. Um, and again, stock is always going to be a variable, mm. a variable thing, you know, but yeah, no, I, I think it's, there, there is no perfect way. Um, but I think getting at least within the ballpark is, is about the best you're going to be able to do, but. Mm-hmm. So the, the only other salary survey that I'm aware of is the, the one conducted by the society of technical communication or SDC. Um, they do one, I don't think it's every year. I think they do one every couple of years, if anyone is aware of that. Um, but it's it's only available to members, so you have to be an SDC member to access it. Um, which and there's the rub. So um, <laughs> the thing I like about this survey is that anyone can read it. It's not paywalled, and I think that's really really important um, because you know for people who, for whatever reason, don't don't find any sort of affiliation with SDC uh, and maybe we're only keeping their membership for that data. 
um, you know, that's that's actually a big like you know cost saving, and also you know um, federating the data like you have, I think is is the right way to go for this sort of information. Um, were there well, any? Think... Yeah, go, oh, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was, yeah, gonna I, was say... I was just gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, did you um what? What was the? Uh, did you sort of have a blueprint of what you were trying to do with the survey? Or was it very much like was it inspired by something like the STC um, salary survey, or was it just purely no? This is what we want to achieve with the survey. How did you sort of plan out what you wanted to do with it? Sure. Yeah. So I've I've heard tell of this survey, but yeah, kind of as you said, it's behind a paywall, and I've never actually seen the data, so I don't, mm. I don't. I don't actually know what the, the SDC survey is like. Um, where I actually drew a lot of our inspiration was from Support Driven. Um, so Support Driven is a, a similar community that's like Write the Docs, but for people doing customer support. Uh, oh. And actually, it was also created out of Portland. Uh, so mm -hmm. this, um, my friend Scott uh, is actually one of the, the co-founders of that community, and we we meet up and have coffee or do a call every like you know three or four months. And um, so actually, I was most inspired by them because I think they've done a really good job with this and they actually have been doing it for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I talked with him about it pretty, pretty strongly. Um, just as, as something, you know, he said that was one of the biggest things they were providing of like concrete value to their community. Um, and kind of to the point of, of publishing it, I, I think there's a really, a really important point there that is, you know, the people who need this most are the least likely to have the privilege of a, of a membership in, in a professional organization, right? The, the person who's most likely to be adversely affected by being underpaid is a, you know, somebody at their first time job, someone who's not being appreciated at their, you know, workplace. Maybe they're not getting sent to conferences. Maybe they're not getting, you know, these educational benefits or memberships. Um, and so I really do think it's, yeah, there's almost a perverse selection by having this data behind a, a paywall. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, quite. No, it's um, it is very interesting. Does anyone else have any uh, insights into yeah. the data? What's really jumping out at you, Tom? I wanted to comment on the comparison to the STC salary uh, database. First of all, the STC doesn't do a survey, e even though they have this salary survey. This is just public data they pull from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so it is available. However, and. and as far as I can tell, the STC kind of outsources this to uh, a sponsor to do, um, and <laughs> and they do a nice job, um, but yeah, it's it's not as if they're doing like a comprehensive survey. the The Bureau of Labor Statistics does these surveys every approximately two years across the industry, and one of the nice things is that it does segment by years of experience, so you can get more of a range and say, well, I've been, I've been in the profession 15 years. I should expect this range versus I'm a complete newbie. I should expect that range. So, uh, there's that, but, um, there's also a European survey. Yeah. I was actually just looking for that. I, I, so I'm looking on Techcom right now to see if they had one, but yeah, I, I just saw mention of it. Cause I know Ellis, uh, Pratt with cherry leaf. I don't know if he, did the survey or just reported on it? But uh, you know, they they focused on Europe because the the SDC one is very U.S. centric, and I don't even know how to uh, evaluate you know pounds and what what exactly that means to to compare if one group is paid more than the other based on location. Um, I was also going to say job titles are also difficult because if if you're trying to find um, like if you're trying to narrow down on job titles, right? How, how did you handle that, Eric? Like if somebody says that they're a information designer or they're a knowledge creator or they're a strategic experience influencer, you know, like a word ninja. <laughs> how do you how, do you do you exclude them? Are they just part of like this larger umbrella? How did you consolidate? So I I think we basically just like said what job titles were. I don't think we actually did like a listing of job title by salary or or any of those kind of breakdowns. And I guess that's one of the other kind of like kind of to your point, the the core kind of questions within surveying is whether, you know, when we started this, we were actually thinking about releasing the data in some kind of an anonymized form, but we realized pretty quickly that there's almost no way to like like when you have somebody's job title and location, <laughs> you know, it's it's pretty easy to like figure out who that human is 
Um, you know, so so this is very unanonymized data because it is so specific. Um, but I think that's really where one of those places where we struggled, where you know we could output a a you know job title average salary, but like when each job title only has you know ten or fifteen people, the value of that data is pretty low, and mm. it, you know it it diminishes pretty quickly. And so we we definitely asked people, but we didn't see a lot of value in the title as like a a, a breakdown point, I guess, or you know like like a way to to judge compensation. You know, maybe senior versus junior would be a, a trivial one, but yeah, the you know user experience architect versus the documentation you know manager or what you know mm -hmm. like I think those are all very different based on the company, I guess. It's actually interesting because I mean my experience of the conferences anyway, the European and the North American conference and the Australian conference um, has been that the community is very full of people who identify as someone who wants to contribute to good documentation but isn't necessarily a documentation person and yet the job titles seem to almost flip that like there's actually only 12 respondents in support and one developer advocate which is not reflective of most of my experience with the people I've met which is strange I'm not mm. sure <laughs> yeah. well yeah and I think that goes back to Tom's point about you know getting a a well-rounded sample Right. Like I, I do think there's a there's always going to be a bias in the respondents. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a little bit more like the job titles might help you understand who actually filled out the survey so that you can kind of match your situation or identity <laughs> against mm -hmm. them. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, it is certainly a, a very hard problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am. Um, I really like having this data and I'm, I'm so happy to see you make it public. I remember I was uh, a few, some years ago. Um, trying to negotiate a, a job salary and I, I uh, leveraged some salary data for the position and negotiated like 10k more because of that. A lot of times these HR groups they don't have like data so they're and they often don't even know the role very well in the industry and so they, it's very difficult for them and when you can present data and say here here's the average salary for somebody in my experience in this area you know or here's here are sample perks, you know, 50% of the people are getting salary bonuses in my profession. You're not providing any, you know, having actual data is huge. And I also really like, I like this discussion. I think I joined right as you were talking about it, but breaking down taboos around salary uh, information. I know there have been some other sites around this that have been even more transparent. I remember um, I was having a discussion with a, with a former colleague who had, who had gone to another company we had a really transparent discussion around salaries, uh, basically shared what salary each of us were receiving. And it was like kind of mind blowing, to be honest, uh, very, very mind blowing and thought thought provoking, because as you said, um, you know, not sharing salaries is in the best interest of the company uh, so that they can basically keep people in the dark. You're constantly playing a guessing game about whether you're <clears throat> paid just right or under or over. And, uh, you know, more information around this topic is definitely more empowering. And if it frustrates, you know, if you find out, oh, my colleague's making like 20K more, well, that should prompt some kind of action. It shouldn't just like dismantle relationships with your colleagues. Mm -hmm. you'd, well, you'd hope so. <laughs> but it's tough. <laughs> when, it, if, when you introduce money into any sort of discussion, it can get heated and it can be divisive. So you're right, Tom, having this data in plain text available to anybody those awkward conversations don't have to happen anymore or you could still have them if you want but you've got this to back it up <laughs> no, least, yeah, it gives you a it gives you an avenue that is not an awkward conversation <laughs> yeah that's right you can start yeah, according, to, according to this where do you, you know where do you <laughs> i'm not it's asking right. you a personal question i'm just asking you how you compare <laughs> yeah. that's right um, all right. And, and I do want to give a little bit more credit um, to Daniel Beck, who is someone who's kind of at the conferences, like each conference, we've done kind of an unconference. Uh, I think in the last year, he's done a talk pay kind of unconference session. Uh, and so he's definitely also someone in the community who's been kind of like advancing and advocating for this, this notion that, you know, the, the more we talk about salary, the, the better it is for everyone. So mm -hmm. um, I think kind of back to the, the inspirations, I think he was definitely someone that that uh, pushed this work along as well. So I definitely wanted to give credit there too. No, definitely. The, the last question I have is, is how many people actually 
analyzed the data and compiled into what we see on, on the writethedocs.org site at the moment. Yeah, so I mean, we basically just had like two kind of core people uh, work on it. And then we had kind of a review team uh, kind of go through and, you know, QA it and ask questions and, and that kind of stuff. So I'd say kind of overall, it was only maybe five, five, five or six folks who really kind of were engaged in the process, but really just two kind of doing the, the bulk of the work. And, and the primary, I guess the primary is Kay, uh, who's actually done the photography for us uh, at the conferences as well. Uh, she also has a background in this kind of stuff. So yeah, so she was kind of the, the core one doing the work. Um, but yeah, so it was definitely a, a pretty small team. And I think that's also part of why it took a little while. I think it took us about three months to to go from, you know, closing the survey to actually publishing the results. But that's just, yeah, it took kind of to Tom's point, it's it's a lot to get your head around <laughs> um, to uh, really yeah. understand how to how to deal with this massive data. And, and we definitely have a decent number of notes for next year to, to hopefully make that processing easier as well. So. Well, that's really fantastic. Well, in closing, yeah. do uh, Tom and Chris, do you have any um other thoughts about the survey that you want to share? No, but uh, alluding to what we were discussing when we opened this, if I get into a territory of salary negotiations soon, I have material. So. <laughs> exactly right. How about you, Tom? Well, I think the timing of this is really interesting because, uh, Chris, you just mentioned you know the scenarios of salary negotiation. And I think one of the big concerns in many people's minds is whether they're going to be laid off or not with the whole like mm. crisis. And so at least... If you do uh, encounter that sort of scenario where you're laid off and suddenly looking for a new job, now you have some salary information, whether you could actually use it right now to demand a raise or to like try to level up might be something you want to feel out. Well, think right? twice because... about <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know if like the timing is right now, but anyway. Hey, I, I had one quick little question about how to how to visualize all this data. Um, what what kind of JavaScript packages or or <laughs> what did you use to do the graphs and everything in your in your report? Uh, it's not JavaScript. It's I forget the exact tool, but yeah, it was all basically taken out of like effectively like an Excel style thing, and then. Yeah, it, it was basically all processed in the background. So this isn't actually live rendered. And oh. These are just images. Oh, it, did you choose that route for a particular reason, that approach? Um, I mean, I think mostly just for that's kind of the tool set that we knew and we knew it was be compatible, you know, across across the world. But yeah, I mean, it, it'd be nice if you could hover and, and kind of have a little bit more interactivity. Um, but then you, yeah. Like we were, we were much more worried about just kind of trying to get it shipped in a in a usable format mm -hmm. than like you know the, the UX of actually interacting with the data, uh, and I and I think that's really you know one of the big questions for us going forward is I'd love to do one where we're actually going to release the data kind of like with people's consent obviously like at the beginning we would say you know like support driven I believe actually releases their raw data and lets people uh -huh. in the community kind of build on top of that because yeah like we're we're not a bunch of JavaScript front end people. <laughs> um, and so it'd be really cool if we could take this data and and the community could could build on it. Um, but we just wanted to do something with aggregated data. We didn't want to kind of have to to force people to to be comfortable, you know, exposing their their identity necessarily. And so we just mm -hmm. for the first one, we we started with, you know, kind of an anonymized. Uh, but I think at some point we'd really love to do one where we could ship the raw data and kind of let people, you know, play with it uh, however they wanted to, because there's there's a million more questions that you could ask if you had the raw data, if you really wanted to. So, mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, look, uh, I think on behalf of the, the community, thanks for taking the effort to actually produce this for us because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal and it's going to make a big impact for a lot of folks who are, you know, probably at this time to actually work out where they sit. Um, and it might actually be, it might actually help people work out, you know, whether they can level up or whether they should just sit and hold for the time being. So I think it's come at like the, just a perfect time um, for the community at the moment. So it's, it's fantastic. Um, okay. Well, moving on to different topics and um, one that's certainly come up for me, which I'll, I'll put on the table is, you know, the adjustment of um, working from home full time. Um, you know, I started off at two days a week and, um, and pretty regularly working from home, I thought, yeah, yeah, I'm totally fine with working from home. This is great. 
and then I've switched to five days a week and things started to change a lot for me, right? I don't know if anyone else has a similar experience or perhaps those that are long-term um, telecommuters might have a, a position on this as well. So I thought I'd open up the question of um, has the way you work changed since um, COVID-19 has started? And have you noticed any differences if you are already a remote employee to how other people have actually started working from home? Actually, so as someone who is mostly, I've always worked remotely. That hasn't necessarily meant work from home. Mm. Um, because I do have access to, well, I did have access to two co-working spaces and an office, but I didn't have to use them. Um, so I kind of worked where I wanted to work. Um, so it hasn't been a huge adjustment. I already had a setup. We already have good internet. We have a good router. I have a good screen. I have a good keyboard. Like working from home was not a huge adjustment. But actually something you said there was what clicked something in my mind. And that actually the bigger adjustment has been me adjusting to other people. Mm -hmm. um, and A, trying to help those people but getting to a certain point where you have to kind of stop because it's too much as well, mm -hmm. because you're, you're not doing your own stuff enough. Um, and also in a similar vein, trying by virtue of trying to help others, like setting up support groups, um, setting up virtual meetups, joining virtual meetups. I did find at least the first week and a half for me, I was way too distracted. And in the second week I had to really cut back so it was actually bizarrely me adapting to other people that affected me more than me, myself, <laughs> if that makes any sort of sense. No, um, that actually does. Yeah. yeah. And definitely, Eric, yeah, like I think the, the whole world is, is trying to figure it out all at once, right? And uh, yeah, I've, I've been working remotely for the past eight years or so. And even, you know, within the teams that I've been on, they're pretty small teams and everyone's been remote, but just the, the world falling apart around you and... Mm -hmm. You know, some of my teammates have had children at home and they've been doing, you know, half days because of childcare. Um, you know, some people just can't stop refreshing the news. Some people can't leave mm -hmm. their house, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's really just the I, I don't think the the biggest change is working from home. It's it's working in the middle of a, a you know, worldwide, you know, health crisis <laughs> mm -hmm. and mm. the, the mental health, um, the mental health struggles that that have been there. You know, I've I've had days where I've struggled just to open my email just mm. because of the the state of the world right and mm. and that mm. is maybe harder if you're trying to adjust from working from home but like i think that's just that's the experience that we're all living through as well that everyone kind of handles differently so i think that's got to be the the biggest change is is mm. just the the mental health side of it for me so yeah I, what about you tom i, mm. I agree i mean I, I work with remote teams all the time and i'm just as productive at home but as Eric said, it's like living, it's trying to work when the whole world is basically falling apart, right? And, and it's mm. so distracting and every single news article is all COVID related. It's, it's like you can't, you can't escape that. So there's like mentally and emotionally it's difficult, even though, yeah, I mean, I'm already set up. I, I sort of get a little impatient when people like can't work remotely very well. They, like they can't connect their video they, or they, their microphone <laughs> sounds terrible. I'm like, come on! Like, you, you work in a tech company. You should, you should be visually present, and and uh, you know your audio should sound crisp. It's not a big deal. But yeah, yeah. you find out suddenly a lot of people are new to it, so it's hard. Well, I found that um, you know a lot of uh, to that point, Chris. I've 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 got a, a coworker that I work with, and he's you know he's got a, a, a headset and he's got like the computer and all that sort of stuff. But you know the it, it's not until you're doing a lot of calls, it's when you realize that, oh, hang on, the equipment that I've been using for the odd call here and there isn't really up to scratch. And I kind of really need to invest in some more gear. So you go, cool, well, I'll go down the shop and I'll go and buy it like a new headset. Um, I've been recommending just some entry-level Microsoft headsets to folks who, who you know, have been like new to um, uh, the whole video conferencing thing because they're easy to like they're cheap they're decent quality um, they're nothing special but you know they get the job done pretty well and the thing is though the, I did the same thing to my colleague and you go oh cool I will go down and, and get one of those none in stock so yep 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 
the yeah. access and availability to tech, like even uh, things like, well, I need to work from home. I've got to get a desk. Uh, there aren't any available literally anywhere in North Legs, at least like standing desks. You cannot buy one for love or money at, at, mm. um, at Ikea, for example. Um, and that's, that's pretty unusual. So getting access to equipment, and the stuff you need to actually effectively work from home, if you're just not set up for it, is probably why a lot of people are really struggling with working from home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's certainly been. Oh, some someone said something that made me want to. Oh, I'm losing lost my train of thought. Uh, do, 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 do. I don't know. Yeah, um, you're right, and that's actually we were I guess all fairly lucky in that we probably had at least fifty percent of what we needed already. Mm. In fact, more so in some cases. Um, I'm actually lending some microphones to some people because I have three microphones. So, you know, <laughs> so I don't need them all at once. So well and truly <laughs> flush with microphones, yeah. <laughs> so stuff like that. You know, you, you can kind of um, help people out with a few things here and there. Uh, yeah. Um, I know actually I had friends looking for webcams. Although I was looking at webcams today and they seem to have come back into stock here at least. So, yeah. <laughs> so well, it's um, like everything really isn't it like the supply chains are, are lean by design so if you know if there's a rush on stuff when we've seen it certainly in australia with panic buying toilet paper you know there's there's a, a very lean connection between like supply and demand in supply chain so if people start buying stuff all in one hit then it's not going to come back on the shelves for a bit until the stuff can be ordered in and you know tech stuff no one makes tech stuff in australia really so you know you're relying on overseas companies to do this for you um so you know it's one of those things you've just got to oh well i guess i'll just wait and and struggle through uh with the stuff i've got until such time as i can get some better gear maybe on the more practical side at least i think 75 percent of us are used to working remotely in, in some way shape or form and i don't mean that in like two of the two of the three of us or anything just like 75 percent in aggregate of us have, mm. have worked from home or worked remotely in some capacity so mm. maybe actually the more useful thing right now um would be does does anyone have any tips advice for coping with the change and as uh tom and eric have both also said coping with the distractions when there's there's you know all sorts of I'm struggling not to use an expletive, but when there's all sorts of things going on around. <laughs> so, I think so, the yeah. biggest thing for me, I've, I've got one thing. Uh, it's it's from two sides. Um, the, the first thing is try, like, it, it's really important with video and stuff when you're talking to people that they can see you. So think about where you've got your, if you can, like some people don't have the luxury of where they set up their home office, and I totally get that. Um, but try and, and front light yourself. Don't don't sit behind a big bright window, um, and 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 just be literally a black shadow, a silhouette. <laughs> on the screen. Uh, I've seen that a fair bit, and you know, you it's, <laughs> oh, oh, wow! Turn on the lights. Jeez, I need sunglasses Subtle. now, Chris. Subtle. Subtle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, there's that, but um. I guess the the other thing too is it's it's on for, for trying to plan out your work day is a thing that I'm really struggling with. Like, when do you have meetings versus when are you actually trying to be productive? And that's really hard when when people all run on different schedules and they all have different conflicting meetings going on, and you're trying to slot in meetings where you can because the demand for FaceTime is now not just FaceTime from an Apple app perspective, but FaceTime in general from talking to people is so much higher because of remote. I'm finding it quite difficult sometimes to focus because you're going from meeting to maybe 30 minutes of work. And we all know that as documentarians, trying to do short bursts of work like that generally isn't productive because you need to get into a, a focal sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, a zone when you're writing, right? So this, this like chopping and changing all the time, I'm finding really hard to do. And one of the things that um, I think we, we might be considering within our team where we're working at the moment is blocking off time. So almost like if you need to do a stand up, you do it between like 9.30 and 10 o'clock in a day. And if that means you have to make tough decisions about what stand ups you go to, then you do that, you know, 
and then if you need to do like sprint sprint reviews or like you know playbacks and stuff like that to your your engineering team well those happen between 1 30 and 3 30 so that way you can sort of slice up and and block out your day and work out you know where your your like sort of where you're most productive because sometimes it's it's different for different people of course so yeah. trying to work out like, when you're most productive versus when the meetings are and then trying to strike a balance between that um i think it's probably the the biggest suggestion like for the long term for me what what are some of the other suggestions that that you folks have on the call i might start with you eric yeah, I don't know if I have a, a lot of great kind of coping suggestions just because I've been doing this for so long. But yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it really is just the, you know, fi finding the way that you prefer to work. And I, like one of the things that for me, I actually have found is I, I much prefer audio calls. Like almost all my meetings I'll do as I walk and I'll just like go out into the woods and, and walk around. And I find myself much able to, I, I'm much better at thinking and talking. And, you know, I, I find that much more productive. But I think a lot of people are rushing towards video. Uh, in this, you know, kind of newly disconnected world. But I, I do think it's good to kind of think about what really does work best for you. Um, and, you know, I think having five video calls a day is just incredibly tiring and, and a little mm. overwhelming. So don't like, I think replacing every in-person interaction with a video call <laughs> is is not the the takeaway, right? It's it's much more like, how can I carve out the space that I need and then get the get the connection that I crave in that work and and find those places. You know, I think the the 37 signals folks have been talking about this for a long time where it's like you know don't replace every meeting <laughs> you know that was going to happen in person with a, a video call like maybe it can become an email now and, and really kind of try to to work a little bit more asynchronously um mm. but that's been the the really huge benefit for me as i've gone at, like transitioning from an office to remote kind of culturally has been that the value of writing and the value of kind of asynchronous communication and you know adapting work to the way I need it to be. Uh, and so, yeah, I think there's there's some like very obvious like one-to-one -one transitions, but this is a, a huge shift. And so I think rethinking, you know, your approach to things is is really necessary if, you're, if your goal is to be productive uh, mm -hmm. as you were in the, the previous paradigm, right? You're not just going to be able to take the exact same thing and move it to another context. You really do have to find what works for you. So mm -hmm. Absolutely. How about you, Tom? I don't have any great tips. I mean, just going along with kind of what Eric said initially, um, <clears throat> if you can take a, a call while you're out walking, that's great. I have a we have a hammock in our backyard, and I uh, went out and laid in there while listening to a call. It was great. Uh, sometimes I'll go on a bike ride in the middle of the day, especially if I have to join a call where I'm mostly a passive listener. Um, it's it's kind of nice. Uh, my back was hurting initially and I thought, oh, my chair just sucks. So I did a bunch of core exercises and it like helped. <laughs> All right. uh, but that might just be my own back. I since have, have dragged my work chair and my work monitor home. So it's it's helped a lot. But uh, I know a lot of people, you know, there's no chair. You're in a weird situation and it's probably not cut out for long term kind of work productivity. And so you might, yeah, might have to get up a lot more. But I, I'm still trying to figure it out, to be honest. Like... Mm. I've, I've even debated like taking my stuff and going to some remote wilderness area and just working to be outside. But I haven't really done that yet because like, uh, as Eric said, a lot of these calls are now video calls. And so you kind of have to mm. present the appearance of being in an office like environment. So if I join from like some woodsy trail, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah anyway. that's fine. Yeah. You just use OBS and green screen your background. If you're in a forest, you already have green in there. <laughs> You can do it with use... Zoom now as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. So, you know, just chroma key in a background, you'll be fine. I've got I one do, guy. I do, think there's, I do think there's, like, value in that kind of creating a sense of space. Like, actually, there's, like, a, a bench that I go to by a creek when I want to do, like, pull request review. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to save all my pull request reviews, and I'm going to go to this bench, and I'm going to just, like, tether my phone, and I'm just going to, like, work from there. And it, like... Some days I'm like, is there more to review? Like, I don't, <laughs> like, I don't want to go home yet. Like, uh, this is the, this is my happy place for the day. And, um, you know, I think if you have the luxury of, of having access to nature or, or shared spaces that are not, you know, full of humans, <laughs> um, mm, you know, yeah. finding the ability to, to have a sense of space, you know, I mean, I think the classic is if you have a room, you can have your office, you know, don't work from your bedroom or yeah. that kind of stuff. But I think even more so 
just creating rituals and, and spaces where you, you know, you have your coffee and you, I read the, you know, Stratechery newsletter or whatever in the morning and then I'll do whatever I need to do, but I know I can like, if it's sunny out, I'll go do my P PR review at the Creek and <laughs> like just creating a little bit of the structure. And it's not like the, like, here's where the meetings go, but it's much more like, how can I make my, my day, you know, fit my, my worldview a little better, I think is maybe the, like, like that was historically the pitch for remote work and working yeah. from home. And I, so I, like don't, I don't think it's go away. So. I'd like to add to that, if I may, just to, you know, it obviously depends who you work for. I think Eric and I are both lucky in that we possibly can be a little bit more flexible. Um, there's not necessarily such a, a prior uh, definition of time in our workplaces anyway. But I would also say that time is very, very fluffy right now. So I don't think time has to apply. You don't have to do Monday to Friday, nine to five, unless you are, um, you have other reasons like a children or, or whatever. And then even then, depending on the age of the child, it, it could vary as well. So I would kind of say at this present moment in time, do what works. So I've been finding, you know, I'm a very sociable person. I can't do a lot of the things I usually would do, like go out in the evening. So what I have been doing instead, because most of my social activities have moved online, which is great. You know, the fact it's even possible is great. I haven't stopped playing board games. I haven't stopped hanging out with friends. I haven't stopped going to meetups, but they've all been online, which means you're staring at a screen all the time, which is my biggest issue. So what I have been doing instead is taking a big break in the middle of the day. So I'll work for a few hours, then take almost my time off in the middle of the day and then do a bit more work and then segue into social time. And so you don't feel like you've been staring at a screen all the day and you've had a bit of a break in the middle. And that's really helped, actually. So sometimes, you know, in times of change, you also just have to change routine a little bit to suit it and do whatever just helps you, not what you feel like you have to do, I suppose. Yeah, that Maybe. sounds fair enough. I think just realizing that, you know, this is an opportunity to. To, to just shake things up a bit um, and yeah. and rethink the way you structure your day. And I think the other thing that, that um, and this, my coworker who's actually been on the, the show before, Giles, he, he has been um, work from home in fully remote company before. And one of the things he's actually uh, coached me on and given me feedback on is the fact that you need to almost over communicate when you're fully remote. Um, mm -hmm. Like it, the things that you would normally do um, you know, in a like in an office, you need to over communicate those things and and to the point where it doesn't feel natural, but in fact, it actually is the right amount of communication to have. So that's something I'm working into at the moment into into my sort of daily work cycle is to to keep the keep the spice flowing, keep the communication flowing and and over communicate a bit more, I think. Mm -hmm. I was nodding vigorously to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because it's yeah. so important, right? Everyone needs to know what everyone else is doing. And I think your point there, Eric, about, you know, maybe considering what constitutes a meeting and going <laughs> like, you know, well, what if we actually put this into something like like this meeting into an agenda into Confluence and had people just asynchronously update it, you know, and give their thoughts that way or put it into a decision register or something like that into Confluence. I mean, Confluence Cloud, not saying that everyone needs to use that tool, but, you know, it has some pretty nice templates now. Um, that you can use to do exactly this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, if your organization's got that already, then, like, take advantage of it because it actually does does help a bit to actually sort of share ideas and quickly iterate on them too. And I think they all, they all build together, right? The, like, not being in person, face-to-face -face on a video call, you know, lets you make your day a little bit more async, lets you take a break, you know, like... Like removing those kind of synchronous commitments lets you, that's the building block for for building the, the kind of day-to-day -day life that you want with your work. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like every meeting that's not a phone call that becomes a an email or a confluence document or, or whatever, um, or a proposal that then has another proposal or something like that, like that's your, you know, 2.30 to 4, you know, sunshine walk in the afternoon <laughs> that you then get to come home and have your, you know, 5 to 6.30, you know, evening you know, work session or whatever, right? It, it's like all of these things work together to to kind of have what you want your kind of work from home life to be. Uh, and if it's just, you know, I'm on, you know, video calls five hours a day, 
then you're sitting in your office five hours a day at those exact hours. <laughs> yeah, um, that's so exactly right. It is really a, a holistic change uh, that needs to happen. So. Hey, Tom, I know you're an avid bike rider and I see <laughs> plenty of plenty of posts of um, your commutes along beautiful um, little paths and stuff on your way to work. Are you are you finding that you're missing that aspect of like working in the office, like the, the, the commute? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, but but uh, in my area, you can still go out and exercise. So I'll still go out and do a bike ride every uh, couple of days. Mm. So that's fine. Um, but yeah, I was going to say, like, I kind of think this work from home scenario or this uh, time is interesting because although a lot of people are just thinking, when am I going to go back to work? How long is this mm. going to last? It's kind of a taste or a preview of a potential future scenario where it's the norm. I mean, mm. what if, uh, you know, in, in later on down the line, people aren't working from home due to the virus, but due to pollution or something, mm. or 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 just maybe companies wake up to the fact that a globalized distributed workforce is so much less expensive when you can hire experts from lots of different areas and you don't have to pay them a, a salary that would be livable and a high cost city like seattle or san francisco suddenly mm. you can hire two people instead of one because one's in like brazil and the other's in canada or something like a far remote region of canada uh what if like companies wake up and realize holy crap we're so much more productive and powerful with this model i also know notice that like uh, it's a lot easier being a remote employee when everybody else is remote too. Uh, <laughs> you, you yes. don't join a standup and, and like you can hear everybody, right? Whereas previously yes. I would join standups. They wouldn't, I mean, you'd have people 20 feet away from a onboard mic. You couldn't hear them and people mm. would, people add more detail in Jira. They have more of an online footprint. It's a lot easier to sort of work. So I don't know. It's, a uh, I, I like the social. I'm not even a social person compared to Chris, who goes to like 40 conferences a year and multiple meetups. I'm I'm like the opposite of that. I don't I don't even I don't have a bunch of friends I hang out with other than you know maybe a basketball game. Uh, so it's not a huge uh, transition for me. Um, but anyway, it's interesting to contemplate this being the norm in a future scenario. Mm. That's the biggest thing I'm sort of like hoping for. I mean, certainly businesses and I've seen this written countless times businesses should not treat this what we're seeing now and experiencing now as what work from home is because it's totally not um, but at the same time they should use it to iterate rapidly on what they what they think works from home should be in their organization and and work out what that balance is and what feels right to them because it will different for each organ it will differ for each organization um, and yeah, just what, just realizing that is really important, I think. Mm. Well, that uh, <laughs> on, on that on, on that bombshell to quote another show. Um, uh, I think we might um, wrap up this episode of Write the Docs, which is episode twenty nine. So uh, I just like to uh, take a moment to thank uh, Eric for coming on the show. Thanks, uh, Eric, for joining us today. Um, it's been great having you. Yeah, thanks for the invite, and uh, thank you all for doing the podcast. It's always always a pleasure. So, no, well, we do it for you know the community as well. So you know, this is all about like giving the community a voice and and making sure everyone's heard within the Right Docs community as well. Which is why um, Chris and Tom and I love doing it because usually every month we get to speak to someone uh, very interesting and um, always learn something from it. So. It's it's really really great to have the opportunity to do it, and uh, thank you, Chris, for coming on uh, very late in, in the Berlin evening this evening, um, and uh, enjoying us today. And for Tom as well, thanks for dropping in and uh, and lending your thoughts to this uh, sort of a, a, a strange, uh, not really structured episode, but uh, <laughs> it's worked out really well. I think I think we covered some good stuff. So uh, it's been very successful. So if you'd like to um, connect with us um, outside of uh, the, the medium that is podcast, you can do so in a number of ways. Well, you can go to podcast.writethedocs.org where we have all of our um, episodes um, up there for you to access free of charge. Um, we've also got um, Write the Docs Slack and you can find us on the podcast channel. 
uh, in Write the Doc Slack. So come and join us. And um, if you like what you've heard on the show, you can come and uh, and maybe suggest some other topics that you'd like to um, hear about, or perhaps even maybe come and join the show um, yourself. Can I can I just add something there as well, Jared? In yes, this, you can. In this current uh, time, but again, as you said, with the working remotely, it doesn't have to be just for now. It can be in the future. We've been hosting a lot more recordings of meetups, virtual meetups, the past couple of weeks. Please yes. keep sending them our way. Um, contact us in the podcast channel. We can either add you to the YouTube channel or we can just upload them for you, whatever works. So you can get your voice on the podcast without even coming on the podcast as well. Yeah, you don't need to talk to us. <laughs> no, it's not even a requirement. Yeah, we're happy to host meetups. It's great to actually have more content up on the uh, the Write the Docs um, YouTube channel and meetups are fantastic for that. So yeah, definitely. That's a really good point, Chris. Contact us and, and get your meetups added up, even if they're virtual. It, even better if they're virtual, really, because you often have very good audio when they're virtual. <laughs> so yeah, do, definitely do that as well. So as always, to close out the show, um, I have one parting comment and that is <clears throat> Docs or it didn't happen. Have an awesome uh, time and stay safe, everyone. Bye for now.